this is a difficult subject to discuss, not least because um, the subject keeps changing pretty much every week, and because um, the people we're going to be discussing it with today know an awful lot about it. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is just throw out a few thoughts, a few ideas, a few observations about what's happened so far, about what could be done to improve the relationship between the Jewish community and the Labour Party, and what, um, what has been done so far, what's gone well and what hasn't gone so well. Um, the, uh, the book, as you say, grew out of my PhD. When I was writing the PhD, when people talked about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, they were basically talking about whether the Daily Mail was publishing anti-Semitic articles about Ed Miliband, um, which I think it did once or twice. Um, and so this whole subject has kind of come out of nowhere, but in another way has been bubbling away for years and years. Um, but anti-Semitism, for one reason or another, is now a national political story, and it stayed a headline national political story for much longer than I think probably any of us are comfortable with or would have expected. Um, the most recent development, as we said, is the Home Affairs Select Committee report, um, which came out this week. And this report, I think, moved on the terms of the debate dramatically and profoundly. Um, until now, there had been a couple of, couple of ideas that had generally been accepted across the debate. One of them being that Jeremy Corbyn is not personally anti-Semitic, and the other being that the Labour Party is not institutionally anti-Semitic. And the Home Affairs Select Committee report shattered the consensus on both these points, I think. On the institutional point, it said, um, and I'm quoting, it gave credence to the idea that elements of the Labour movement are institutionally anti-Semitic, which is the first report that had done that. The Royal Report didn't, Chakrabarti Report didn't. On Jeremy Corbyn himself, the Home Affairs Select Committee put together an interesting combination of ideas that when you combine them don't reflect well at all on the Labour leader. They acknowledge that, and again I'm quoting, that he has a proud record of campaigning against many types of racism. But they then said it is perfectly possible for an anti-racist campaigner to express anti-Semitic views. And they explain this because they said Corbyn personally in their view, does not fully appreciate the distinct nature of post-Second World War anti-Semitism. That is, he's stuck in a paradigm where anti-Semitism just comes from the far right. Um, whereas modern anti-Semitism, and the kind of anti-Semitism that really affects and concerns Jewish communities in Europe nowadays, comes from other places. Um, they then said an individual's demonstrated opposition to other forms of racism does not negate the possibility that they hold anti-Semitic beliefs. And they implied very strongly that his lack of consistent leadership on the issue, their words, his reluctance to separate anti-Semitism from other forms of racism, their words, have actually enabled the growth of anti-Semitism in the party. Now you put all these ideas together and they're putting him very much on the spot in a personal way as Labour leader. Um, debates about this issue quite often become these kind of dead-end debates about is this person or that person anti-Semitic? And uh, nobody ever agrees. And of course, the person being accused of anti-Semitism anti vigorously and genuinely denies it. And people don't even agree about what, how they're defining anti-Semitism anyway, and it gets us nowhere. And what the report is saying quite correctly is that actually a person's innermost feelings don't really matter in this. It's about their words, their actions, sometimes it's about their inaction and the impact that that has. Um, and in that respect, they portray Jeremy Corbyn personally as very much part of the problem. Now, and this is what the Chakrabarti report very much didn't do. It didn't go anywhere near the current Labour leadership and their politics. It didn't address the question of whether the particular brand of anti-Zionist politics and the particular understanding of racism that tends to exclude modern anti-Semitism that is strong in the part of the left that Jeremy Corbyn comes from, not only creates a space where anti-Semitism can grow, but actually helps it grow. And the Home Affairs Select Committee went straight for it. Now, this is a classic example of how if you don't deal with the problem when it first comes up, it just grows and it gets worse and it comes right onto your doorstep. This has been growing in the Labour Party for a while. There were the initial concerns, even during the leadership campaign last year, about Jeremy Corbyn's past associations and statements. There was the whole story from the Oxford University Labour Club in February, which came out, which still hasn't been resolved by the party. Then you had Nas Shah and Ken Livingstone in April, you had the Chakrabarti report. None of these things 
were dealt with properly, and the, by the Home Affairs Select Committee getting involved and passing these judgments on Labour and on its leader, they have made this no longer just a problem, I think, between the Labour Party and the Jewish community, but it actually gets, they are getting right to the heart of what the party is. Um, but it leads me to think, and this is a question I think that is not an easy one to answer, why is it that what's happened in the Labour Party has caused such concern in the Jewish community? Why is it that, you know, a, a, a relatively small compared to the size of the party, number of cases of members and activists, most of whom no one had ever heard of, saying or writing anti-Semitic things on social media a couple of years ago, has caused such upset and such concern across the Jewish community and it's been so damaging. When, to use a relatively recent example, a Tory MP wearing a Nazi uniform on a stag do didn't do the same damage to the relationship between the community and the Tory party. And I think if we can answer that question, we can understand what actually needs to be done from this point. And I think one reason is that the things that have come out from the Labour Party this year are seen by a lot of people, as, a lot of people in the Jewish community certainly, as not anomalies. And the reason they're not seen as anomalies is because um, really for the last 15 years or more, and in some cases for the last 30 years, we've seen the growth of problematic and at times downright hostile ideas about Jews, Zionism, Israel, growing on the left, going way beyond what might be counted normal political criticism or normal political language. Um, and without really any internal strong opposition within the left, so in recent years, you know, it has been possible and has actually happened many times. People can say whatever they want in the Labour Party, supporting Hamas, supporting Hezbollah, comparing Israel to Nazi Germany, talking about Zionist tentacles and Jewish cabals in British politics, talking about very similar conspiracy theories in American politics. And unless you're Gilad Atzmon, basically if you cloak it in the thinnest kind of anti-Israel language, you're okay. Right? And we've seen huge demonstrations through the streets of London with lots and lots of people waving their We're All Hezbollah placards, people from the stage giving speeches in support of Hamas, comparing Hamas to the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, um, riots outside the Israeli embassy where when the people who were smashing up shop fronts on that road got put in prison, Jeremy Corbyn defended them and said they shouldn't have even been prosecuted. Right? And I think one thing people missed is how much anger and upset this was causing in the Jewish community all the way through, right? Everyone, there's a narrative about anger in, on the left, anger in Muslim communities about Palestine. There's anger built up in the Jewish community about this as well for many years, and I think people have missed it. And I think that's why when all these cases have come out, um, a lot of people in the Jewish community have said, well, yeah, of course, of course they speak like that. That's, that's the left now. Whereas nobody would seriously argue that, that, that anyone is politically mobilising for support for Nazism in the Tory party. Right? So one Tory MP wears a Nazi uniform and it's outrageous and it's offensive, but it doesn't feel like it has any further political meaning in terms of what the Tory party is, rightly or wrongly. This is, and a lot of this is about appearances and perceptions. Right? You add to that, the fact that the same part of the left we're talking about, and this isn't all the left, this part of kind of the hard left and the left that Jeremy Corbyn has been personally associated with for so long, doesn't really talk about or get or oppose modern anti-Semitism, right? If swastikas are daubed on Jewish gravestones, the Jewish community gets all the anti-racist solidarity it wants, right? But when jihadists murder Jews in Paris and in Toulouse and in Brussels, a lot of people on the left find it hard to even mention the word anti-Semitism in their analysis of it. It just it isn't seen in that framework, right? And yet this this kind of anti-Semitism is the reason why there are so many more French Jews in London now than there were a decade ago, right? It's the reason why there are leaders of Jewish communities in parts of Europe saying there's no future for their communities in those cities, right? Not in Britain, I hasten to add, right? But that is what's going on in some European Jewish communities. And yet, to give one example, a couple of years ago, the Institute for Race Relations brought out a report on the new anti-Semitism in which they said, 
any talk of a new anti-Semitism coming from European Muslims is a completely Islamophobic campaign allied to fascists. They even put it in the same bracket as Anders Breivik. Right? So there's a complete disconnect. Quite often, people think this disconnect is over Israel, and there is one there, but there's just as big a disconnect over anti-Semitism, and in some ways that's more important. Um, so that's, that's the problem. That's the scale of the problem. And I think when, I, when we look at what's been done to try and deal with this problem so far, one reason why it hasn't worked is because all the good things that have been done haven't really got to this problem in a deep way. There hasn't been a sign of really people on the left showing the necessary introspection, doing a Nas Shah, basically, and rethinking this kind of policy. Now, having said that, there have been good things that have done. I'm not one of those who says the Chakrabarti report was completely useless, right? It did have some good things in it. It had some good things about language. They were a bit limited, but still, good things, right? It was the start of a process of beef, beefing up the rules, but again, the some of the changes to processes she brought in, I thought, actually, in some ways, weakened them. But at least it was the start of a process. It was an acknowledgement there's a problem, and the language from the Labour leadership on anti-Semitism has improved. And the section of Jeremy Corbyn's confidence speech on it was the strongest yet, and I think it was very well received. But unless it's allied to action, and unless it comes with a, a, a really detailed and concrete re-evaluation of this kind of politics that I've been talking about, it's been building for many years, um, and which is the kind of things I write about in the book, it's always going to seem a bit superficial and therefore a bit in inauthentic. I think a lot more needs to be done to persuade the Jewish community in that respect, um, or that majority of the Jewish community that feels that way. Um, and I think some of the other language coming out hasn't been that helpful. The response to the Home Affairs Select Committee report wasn't helpful. I can understand why Jeremy Corbyn didn't like it, but I think he went too far in rejecting it. Anyone who thinks this is all a campaign against Corbyn because suddenly the Labour Party is led by a left-winger needs to have a look at what happens between the Jewish community and the Lib Dems in recent years because of Jenny Tom and David Ward. It was basically the same thing. It didn't get the same headlines because the Lib Dems are not as big and important a party as Labour. But it's basically the same process. And these headlines haven't been driven by the Jewish community. Most of these cases that came out were not, did not come from ourselves or the Board of Deputies or JLC or so on. Um, but the response that's there is an authentic response. Um, the, I thought party conference would be a good opportunity to take the temperature in this relationship, actually. And I came back from party conference not actually knowing whether it had been good or bad. It reminded me of NUS conferences in pretty much every single way, even down to the fact that there was basically no security on, on the door, despite the whole row about security. Um, but, you know, we used to leave NUS conference thinking if no damage had been done, then it was a success, basically. Um, and I left this Labour Party conference thinking, well, the JLM rule change would have been a really powerful step forward, but it didn't happen, which is really bad. But on the other hand, nothing happened to make things worse, necessarily. Um, the JLM rally was great, and the lineup of people on it was really important and significant. The things that were said were really important. But um, I was also at the momentum debate that Jeremy Newmark took part in on anti-Semitism. I thought he spoke very well, but there was a lot about that debate that I really, that really worried me, actually, in terms of the atmosphere in the room, in terms of certainly one of the other speeches, the leaflets being handed out outside about JLM being a representative of a foreign power. It's the kind of language that when I joined CST 20 years ago, I only used to read in fascist magazines. Uh, and here it was being handed out outside the Momentum Fringe. So, so there were good and bad aspects, I think. Um, one thing that is definitely the situation we're in, that I think we need to, that is both in some ways good and bad, is that um, there have always been these divides on the left about anti-Semitism and relations with, with Jews and Jewish peoplehood and Zionism and so on. 
And at different times, these traditions have been politically operational within the left. They've actually mattered in terms of internal left-wing politics and left external relations as well. And this is clearly one of those times. We're in one of those moments. Which is not something, again, I would say that from a Jewish community perspective, I'd ever welcome because while it brings, I suppose, opportunities and it highlights friends, it also brings dangers for the community. It's not something that, in the end, is likely to be beneficial, but it is where we are. Um, and to give one example about this, and this is really kind of my final point, and then I'll be very interested to hear the discussion that follows. Um, there are people in the party who, are, who don't want to hear any talk about anti-Semitism, who see it as a threat to their political project, who argue it's all a fabrication, it's all a fake campaign cooked up by a combination of Zionists and Blairites, right? And these are their words, not mine, right? And any examples of anti-Semitism needs to be explained away or denied or dismissed because they threaten the project, right? Now, this obviously is not a way to rebuild confidence between the party and the community. I'm not in a position to assess how influential or representative these voices are, but they're certainly loud. And I think that one first step would be for very strong statements and indication from the party leadership that they don't share these views, basically, that these people are maybe a loud fringe, but they're not in any way talking, uh, speaking a language and representing ideas that are shared in any broad way in the party. Um, because if they are shared in any broad way in the party, then we're really not going to get anywhere. 